Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap here at the end of the week with my good friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. How you doing, Lance? I, I'm not. I was better before you started. I got downgraded from great to good friend this week. So I not was going to say you got demoted. Yeah, I figure you can't be the great friend every week or else the great you know, modifier just loses its its punch. I got it. Um, and I, could, I thought of going up from there, but I mean, where do you go from great? I mean, our our spectacularly fantastic <laughs> guest friend. Yeah, yeah, you know, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. I like okay. those words. adjectives. Um, are good. <clears throat> well, look, um, we're we're pushing up against the July Fourth holidays here. Um, for appreciate anybody who's watching this, because I'm sure we're competing with you know pool parties and burgers and stuff like that. Um, we'll try to be concise, which is definitely something we're not good at, but we'll see what we can do this week. Um, all right, let's well, quickly looking at the markets. Um, the market was up slightly this week. You know, not a barn burner, but but you know, up. Um, you have said in past weeks that the longer this market sort of treads sideways, sort of hangs out in a trading pattern here, that that's bullish, right? Because that's that lets the data, the moving averages, catch up to where prices are, and then that can form a base that that future price appreciation appreciation can be built off of. Is that still correct in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we had talked about, um, I guess, a couple of weeks ago uh, that we were due for a correction. The market had gotten three standard deviation. And again, don't just, you know, just set aside all the technical mumbo jumbo for a second. And just hear what I'm saying. We just said that the market was getting very overbought. We were due for a correction and we had a decent correction. We actually sold off back to the 20 day moving average. We hit that basically on Monday, Tuesday of this week rallied nicely off of that. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the markets bounced off that 20-day moving average. Now, we're still below the previous highs, but it is not uncommon that when you're going through a corrective phase, whatever it is, that your first test of support, which in this case is the 20-day moving average, the market will try to find that and hold that, and particularly in this market that's very bullishly biased right now, uh, investor sentiment is very uh, aggressively bullish at the moment. So not surprising to see buyers step in. Um, also, too, this was an end of the quarter rebalancing for a lot of pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds. So markets were really just kind of all over the place this week. I mean, you know, tech was up one day, down one day. Energy was up one day, down one day. And it just, you know, markets were just really kind of all over the place uh, this whole week because um, just portfolios were having to be rebalanced, take take profits out of one area, you know, buy buy stocks in another area and get portfolios back in line with benchmarks. So, um, you know, two things that really kind of stood out for the week in, in, in kind of in total was Thursday's action more than anything else. Um, bonds took a pretty good clip on Thursday. Now, bonds have been actually rallying pretty nicely here over the last week or so. Um, we'd see money flows going into bonds. And then on Thursday, they got clipped pretty well on, you know, kind of a, a wake up moment as Jerome Powell, and this is nothing new from way very that the fed is not done hiking rates the boy that cried wolf they go we're not done hiking rates markets are like well whatever um and markets have been rallying well on thursday uh he was speaking in spain pretty much reiterated that the feds got to hike rates more and then at the same right after that we got the gdp report for the first quarter that had a massive revision to it and jumped GDP growth from 1.3 to 2% for the first quarter. Most of that was a, 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 a big surge in, in consumer spending, but also a very big adjustment to net exports, which I don't know where that came from. It was just, they had a big massive mathematical revision to net exports. But both of those combined together, um, really kind of stepped the market back saying, oh yeah, the, the, mar the economy's, way too strong here. If the Fed doesn't knock it down here a bit, we're going to get a resurgence in inflation. So bonds took it on the chin on Friday, uh, sorry, on Thursday. Um, and, and again, but again, even that part of that is this end of the quarter rebalancing. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into what happened this week. I think more importantly, it's going to be what happens really kind of after we get into the, the first part of July, get past the holiday, traders come back to the market next week. Um, you know, we'll see what goes on from there. Okay. And I'm curious, you know, you, you've long, you know, told us that, okay, at the end of a quarter, there's all this scramble to window dress and particularly a quarter like we've had, 
right? Where there've been some stocks that have really taken off. You know, every every fund manager wants to show that they're owning those stocks, you know, at, at the end of the quarter when they have to report their holdings. Right. Um, do you do you ever normally see sort of like a, a retracement or an easing off at the beginning of the next quarter after that mad dash? Sometimes, but it, but also too, you know, as we get into the new quarter, right? So all the fund managers that weren't in these certain stocks that were going up a lot, they put them on right at the end of the quarter um, to get them on their books, but they may have put on small positions. But then as soon as the quarter starts, they add a whole bunch to it because they got the rest of the quarter to allow that position to work on their on their portfolio. So generally what you'll see is some selling going into the end of the quarter, that's the rebalancing part. And then you'll see them, you know, overweighting sectors or whatever they're going to do as they come back into the new quarter. And again, as we get into next week, not only is it the beginning of new quarter, it's also the beginning of second quarter earnings. So now all of a sudden we've got a lot of bets being placed on companies like NVIDIA and AMD and others that their earnings because of AI are going to be absolutely stellar. And so there's going to be a kind of, I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a pretty decent scramble that pushes semiconductor stocks and probably the market as a whole up to new highs for this year in the month of July. Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all. Semiconductor stocks to new highs in July or the well, market no, no, for, to new yeah, highs? Yeah, yeah, no, not, not all-time highs, but just highs for this year. In other words, you know, semiconductors hit a recent high, they sold off, and it wouldn't surprise me to see them go back to that previous high, Okay, uh, you know, in the next month. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you weren't calling for the markets to hit a new all-time high next month. You're not. No, 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 no. Just, <laughs> just, just a higher level than we were last month, right? Got so. it, got it, yeah. And it's so interesting what a difference half a year makes, right? I mean, coming into this year, we were coming off of one of the worst years ever for stocks and bonds collectively, right? And now the like the S and P's up what fifteen plus percent the first half of this year. The Nasdaq's had like its best start to the year in how many ever. decades? Ever, ever. It's okay, the best start ever for the Nasdaq. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so and, and, uh, and, and, and news about that is, statistically speaking, when the market is up 10 percent or more in the first half of the year, it generally finishes the year broadly positive and generally tax on another seven to 10 percent by the end of the year. So, you know, you're potentially talking about a market that could be up 20 percent plus by the end of this year. And that's going to be hard. That's going to be very hard for people to fathom um, by the time we get to the end of the year, if that happens. Yeah. Um, well, you know, if that happens, and of course, you know, you you did a very good job at the beginning of this year telling people that, yeah, things look pretty dire, but things are probably pretty oversold and, you know, don't discount where stocks, the fact that stocks could recover here more than people are expecting right now. And that has been the case pretty much month after month after month this year. Although I think now we've flipped to where now that people are beginning to expect the market to be higher next month. We've, we've, Flip from pessimism yeah. to optimism now. Yeah, no, that and that was that was the point I was going to bring up is that the one big difference, you know. So back in October, when we were talking about, you know, this market could do something you really don't expect it to do, and I was writing that article. You know, everybody was expecting Fang stocks were dead, right? And I wrote the article, "Are Fang stocks dead?" Question mark. And the point of that article was, no, probably not, because once you start seeing disinflation show up in the economy, which is what we're seeing now. Money's going to move sit and move back into cyclical stocks that are longer duration assets, and that's exactly what happened. So it, it, it's you know that part you sh, you know was clear that was going to happen, but part of that thesis was that extreme negative bearish sentiment of investors. We had the lowest bearish sentiment of both professional and investors since two thousand and eight. You know from the from the sentiment perspective, it was like we had just gone through a financial crisis in the markets. And so you had such negative sentiment that there was a, a lot of fuel there for a rally. Now, professional investor sentiment is getting very, very bullish. We are, we are getting back up to levels that have historically kind of marked the top of rallies, at least in the short term. And you should expect we've had, we've had basically a very low volatility market this year. We haven't had a 3% correction in a very long stretch uh, since October. We haven't had a 3% correction in the markets that's unusual to go that long without a 3% correction. So you should expect sometime this summer, potentially a three to five to seven, even a 10% correction, completely normal within a rip and bull market to have that type of a correction. That'll be a good buying opportunity. But because we have so much bullish sentiment, that kind of really sets that, that corrective action up 
because kind of everybody's on one side of the boat. So as soon as somebody holds their hand up and says, I'm going to sell here, you potentially get kind of a herd effect that creates a short term correction. Again, that'll be a buying opportunity, but, you know, that'll give you a much better risk reward basis to, to enter the market than where we are right now. Right. And what's interesting, and, and I'm working my way here to a piece that you wrote this week, um, but is, you know, bull markets climb a wall of worry, right? Well, what happens when the worry goes away? Right? <laughs> um, same thing about the most telegraphed recession, you know, in history that, that you've long mentioned, uh, the fact that, hey, since everyone's expecting it, it may not materialize. And, and voila, here we are, you know, far in the halfway through 2023 right now, and it hasn't materialized yet, at least not not super visibly. Um, now we're getting all this talk about not even soft reset landing, but maybe no landing, right? Maybe we avoided all this, right? Maybe that then opens up, you know, the potential for a recession to hit because folks are finally giving up the expectation of it, right? Um, all right. Psychology, look, so, psychology look, is a right. very, I was just saying, you know, just psychology is a very interesting thing about the market. And that's really you know, as investors, we've got to be part psychologist. And, you know, remember, the whole market is just a bunch of people buying and selling. That's all it is. So, you know, more than anything else, it's just understanding the psychology of what happens between buyers and sellers within a live marketplace. And that's that's the fascinating part about this, right? So if you really, you know, just kind of examine what people are doing, you know, it's, it's just interesting to watch how their psychology works. You know, all the pain that everybody had last year, the fear, it's all gone now. We're all happy. And, you know, now we got to buy stocks, take on as much risk as we can get. And it's interesting because, you know, we're having conversation with clients, your, you know, your, your clients um, mm -hmm. that, you know, came over last year and they're like, I don't want to be in the markets and I'm, and I'm super concerned. You know, I want to be in precious metals and, and bonds and cash. That's all I want. I don't want any extra exposure. The world's going to end. The dollar's going to collapse. And now those same individuals are going, um, I don't understand why we don't have a whole lot more equity exposure. And, you know, the market's up 15%. We're only up, you know, 6 7% this year. Well, it's because 15% of that's driven by seven stocks. Uh, the other 493 are up about 5% this year. So, you know, there's part and, of and there's those seven stocks, as you said, were stocks folks didn't want to touch last Absolutely. October. Yeah. Absolutely. But, it, but it's interesting now. And my point is, is about psychology is that all these people that were super negative last year, are trying to figure out how to get more exposure to the markets now. And, and so it, it's an interesting conversation. Like, hey, you told us to be super conservative and now they want to be super aggressive. So it's just a very, but this is that psychology that I'm talking about. Everybody forgot about, you know, everything last year and now it's sunshine and roses and we've got to be back on the, on the train. So it, it, it's just, again, that's the psychology of the market and how it works. Well, and that's one of the things I find so interesting about this, this time right now for the retail investor, right, is we went from oh no, right, at the end of last year to, to FOMO again now, right, um, in a really quick period of time. And, and the, the, the really like tough question you got to ask yourself right now, if you've been, if you feel you're, you're too defensively positioned or you're sitting on the sidelines or whatever, and you want to jump back in now, is how much do you really trust the market from here? Right. And that's a great segue into this piece you wrote, which was basically, are we looking at a bull trap right mm -hmm. now? Um, or uh, is it right? Bull, bull trap market. or bear market? Those are the same no, no. thing, aren't they? No, no. Yeah. Bull trap is basically sucking investors in and the bear market continues. The question is, are we in a bull trap or are we back into a bull market? And back into a bull market. Yeah. Bull trap or bull market. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you really have to answer that question you know, to a high degree of confidence for you to yeah. decide what to do here. I mean, I guess that whether you're going to jump back in or whether you're going to stay in if you're already in, right? You got to really answer that question. So um, what data do you look at when you're making that assessment, right? When you are when you as a capital manager are trying to say, look, is, is this something that really has legs or is this something I've got to be really, you know, suspicious about? Well, you know, so the thing about it, so part, part, of, the, part of the question is psychology. OK, and, and again, so going back to what we just said, said a second ago, what is the sentiment of the market? And again, when last year we had several bull market rallies that failed and they were bull traps, clearly um, a good example of that when we had a 20 percent rally that began uh, kind of began late May, went into June and July. Um, we had a 20 percent rally 
the market retraced 50% of its decline. That's a Fibonacci retracement. But historically, this was all, now I'm just going to quote to you the headlines that were coming out in the media. Market's up 20%. It's a new bull market. Market retraces 50% of its decline. Historically, that means markets go higher from here. Um, the bull market is back. That was You can go look back at, at media headlines for June, July last year, and you're going to find a lot of those headlines. Bull mar- new bull market. It wasn't a new bull market. We knew it wasn't a bull market then. We knew that that was a bull trap. Why? because of several technical factors, as well as psychological factors. First of all, everybody was still extremely negative. There was no turn into bullish sentiment at that point as the market was rallying. In other words, people weren't going, okay, time to be bullish again, right? And and so there was that lack of money flow of psychology coming back into the markets, people wanting to get exposure that wasn't occurring. So that tells you that people were still being very defensive, very negative. Um, They were keeping capital on the sidelines. The second thing was, is that the 50-day moving average was crossed below the 200-day moving average. This is what we call a, 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 a bearish cross, or to get more you know vocal about it, it's the death cross, right? <laughs> uh, and, and you know this is that, and all that means is, is that you have prices trading below a major resistance, that 200-day moving average. That's a very important resistance level for stocks. That's the average price over 200 days. So when you're below that, you know, kind of think about, you know, somebody holding your head underwater, right? And, and they've got their head, their hand on top of your head and pushing you down into the water. Well, it's hard to get back above the water. And that's what that resistance level is for stocks. And so the market was rallying. Yes, we were up 20%, but we were running right into that heavy resistance at the 200-day moving average. There was also several other factors out there that, you know, from momentum as well as breadth of the market and a variety of others also suggesting that investors and, and professional investors were not coming back into the market. So very likely that rally then was a bear market rally. And of course it was. And we wound up testing new lows in October. At that point, we had extremely negative sentiment. And that's where you and I started talking about you know, extremely negative sentiment, set up for a rally, those type of things. Now, fast forward to today, we have the market up 20%, right? We've retraced more than 50% of the decline, just as we did back then. So what's the, why is this time a bull market versus last time being a bull trap? The reason this is a new bull market is because the market is trading above the 50-day moving average. It is trading above the 200-day moving average. So now, that hand that was holding you underneath the water is now hands holding you above the water, keeping you supported, giving you a lift, you know, so to speak, to go higher. Um, also, the 50-day moving average is now crossed back above the 200-day moving average. This is what's called a golden cross. Because these moving averages are price trends over time, it says that near-term prices are now trending a lot more positively and longer term prices, and if we look at the 200-day moving average, it's now starting to slope positively as well. Those are all indications now that the bull market is now back. So this is the, the difference between today and what we saw back last year is that in during a bull trap, you sell rallies. So as you get a rally to the 200-day moving average, you sell that rally and raise cash. Now you buy dips between the 50 and the 200 day moving average. So any dip in the market that gets you to the 50 or moving average, you'll want to buy that because that's because we're the, the market trend is now positive and we want to participate in that rally. Um, how do you know if something goes terribly wrong? And the, let's just assume for a moment, this is a, a big giant bull trap. And in the next six months or a year, something happens economically, financially, whatever it is, well, if we break the 200-day moving average and we start to roll the 50-day 50, uh, 50 moving average back over again, in other words, we start to set up that same repeat of technicals that we saw at the beginning of January of 2022, you'll know that you're heading back into a bear market. But right now, we're in a bull market. So your actions have to change from being defensive to being offensive. All right. Very well said. Um, I did my best to put up charts from your article as you were speaking there too, Lance. So basically this is, and I hate to say it this way, uh, it's a terrible analogy, but it's just the one that springs to mind. Um, It's the Chuck Prince quote about like dancing while the music's playing, or you're like, look, it's a bull market and we need to treat it as such until the data basically proves to us it is no longer one. 
Yeah, and that's why if you, if you read the article, if you go to the website, um, it, it's it's right on the front page of our Insights blog on our website. Um, it's called Bull Trap or Bull Market. At the bottom of that, I've posted a graphic that you can basically clip and save to your desktop or whatever you want. But it's our 15 trading rules to manage risk in a portfolio. But it tells you these 15 rules, if you'll follow these, and this, this will allow you to participate and trade a bullish market while it exists. But it'll also help you manage the risk of you know, potentially when things, and things will change. Will we have another bear market? Absolutely. Could it happen six months from now? Possibly. Could it happen next year? Absolutely, right? We could certainly have a bull market that reverts back into a bear market. That happens all the time. So just because it's a bull market now doesn't mean that I'm saying, oh, you're, it's a bull market. So 20 years from now, call me back and we'll talk about the next bear market. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that this market is going to be higher most likely 12 to 18 months from now, this market will be higher than it is today. Doesn't mean though, it's not going to give you some corrections along the way where you can enter this market more safely on a risk reward basis and, and manage your money for a better return. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that um, that list of 15 rules. Um, they're, they're Just to clarify for folks, I don't think they're, they're bull market only rules. They just seem to yeah. me to be good rules for investing. Um, I actually have noted here for us to go through those if we have time sure. in, in this conversation. I'd like to if we have time near the end. Um, but um, it's okay with you, Lance. What I'll do is I'll post them. Um, uh, I'll put a link below here where folks can, can download exactly that PDF of those rules. Um, that'll be at wealthion.com slash Lance rules. All one word, folks. Uh, there'll be a link there, Lance, to the full article as well. And folks should definitely go to realinvestmentadvice.com to read that article and all the other ones you have there too. Yeah, because I need the traffic at my website. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but <laughs> but I think that rules, like you said, I think that's something that everybody should just print out and put on the wall, you know, wherever they do their trading. Um, you've encapsulated, you know, decades of experience into a really well, let, let me be understandable list. But, yeah, but let me be clear about these rules. These are not my rules entirely. Uh, they've been reworded in my voice, right? But these, if you go look at any of the great traders throughout history, Paul Tudor Jones, Warren Buffett, uh, you know, Jesse Livermore, you know, uh, uh, Seth Carman, you know, pick your favorite trader. All of them at some point or another have published lists of their rules, right? Um, you know, uh, Peter Lynch, et cetera. And what you'll find is that, not surprisingly, that all of them have the same rules. Uh, they're worded differently, but they all are the same rules. Like, for instance, you know, never, never dollar cost average into losers. That's just a very basic tenet. No good investor actually does that, even though people tell you to do it all the time. Dollar cost average. Nobody does that. You know, Seth, you know, uh, you know, a lot of advisors say, oh, you just need to you know, buy an index fund and dollar cost average into it over the long term. That's OK. It'll work. Right. It's not a terrible strategy if you don't want to pay any attention to your money and you'll get the index return over time. But there is not one portfolio manager on the planet ever from Ray Dalio to Warren Buffett to anybody else that has ever dollar cost averaged anything. Right. You know, they're they're buying big chunks of companies at deep value and those type of things. So all these rules are basically I've, I've studied all these guys right over my third. How old am I now? Thirty seven years. Right. So. You know, I've studied all these guys. And what I did is these 15 rules are basically a compilation of all of their rules um, and just kind of reworded for ease, 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 ease of reading, right? Shortened down and, and those type of things. But these are what every great trader, investor, portfolio manager, et cetera, this is how they manage risk. And, you know, the, the things that you do and that you don't do over time that wind up costing you capital by making bad mistakes. So, you know, use the experience, you know, they've all, look, every trader loses money. Every investor makes a bad investment. If anybody ever tells you they've never lost money, they are absolutely lying to you because you cannot <laughs> invest in the market and not lose money. But why not? Instead of trying to figure it out yourself, why not go to the experience of these guys who have made all the mistakes and take their rules and apply that to your own discipline so you just don't repeat the same mistakes over again, because the, the, the mistakes that everybody makes are always the same. The markets are markets are markets and, and buying and selling stocks are always the same. 
So the mistakes that people make that cost them money is the same mistake that everybody else in the market has made at one point or another. I still make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I go back to my rules and I go, what did I do wrong? Yeah, there it is, mm-hmm. line 13. You know, do more of what works and less of what doesn't, right? <laughs> it's just a really good rule uh, to follow. Uh, but, you know, it, we all make mistakes. We're going to continue to make mistakes. We always allow our emotions to get in the face of what we're doing. These rules will just help you stop doing that as much. You're still going to do it, but maybe just not as much. <laughs> all right. But yes, so you've been standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, you've condensed the wisdom of the experts, maybe put it into your own homespun Texas drawl. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's all there for people. <laughs> There's to a lot access. of y'all in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, great. Um, well, reminder, folks, uh, wealthion.com slash slash Lance Rules. We'll have a link to that down below the video, too, if you want to go there and get it. Um, all right. So uh, let's see here. Um, I want to get to another piece that your colleague, Michael Leibowitz, released this week. But quick before I do, I just want to go back to AI for a second, because yep. yep. um, we've talked about that a, a lot in past weeks. Um we've yet to talk about it too much this show. I don't want to talk too much on it, but but a few things I want to mention. One is um, the stocks have paused. We'll put it here. Like the, the major, the, the NVIDIAs, the Microsofts, et cetera, they're down a little bit, not a lot, but they're down a little bit. Um, and so, uh, I guess one question is, is which we don't know the answer to yet, but is this like a pause that refreshes or, or is the, is have we seen peak AI mania, you know, and, and no, you're, you're shaking your head. I would say we don't know. I think you're probably a bit more confident the animal spirits have further run, but yeah, it's just, you know, this is the, first, so here, again, you know, the way markets work, right? Uh, and, and again, look, I know nothing for certain. So just, you know, whatever I say, just take everything I say with a grain of salt, because I don't know any more than anybody else. I just, oh. you know, what, I, what I just try to apply to things is, you know, I've got a long history of dealing with this stuff over time, and I've seen these type of things occur before. But when you have that initial run higher, so NVIDIA was on a, t- let's just use NVIDIA as an example. AMD is the same way. When these stocks take off on this tear, there's a whole bunch of people that go, well, I missed it. And if that thing ever pulls back, I'm going to buy it, right? So that first kind of pause pullback you're going to get is going to get bought by all the people that feel like they missed it. That's the entry point, yeah, for all the owners. And and it's just a psychological thing, right? It's like the stock's up 169% this year. It trades 40 times price to sales. It's ridiculously expensive. But people are going to assume that if it went up 169% this year so far, it's going to go up another 169% the rest of this year, right? It's just, you know, people's psychology about markets is that once something starts going, it's just going to go that way forever. That's not the way stocks work. But the point is, is that there's there's a lot of people sitting out here that want to buy that AI trade. And they're just looking. And again, you know, these stocks have dipped minorly. And every time NVIDIA comes down, you know, five, 10 points, you see buyers show up and start trying to buy this thing. Um, so, you know, they're both on sell, AMD and NVIDIA both right now are on sell signals. It suggests that probably that these stocks are going to chop around here a bit. But when they go back on buy signals, I would expect them to be at new highs for the year, you know, probably by the end of the summer, you know, and hopefully we'll get a little bit more of a correction along the way. Uh, we're probably going to add to our AMD. We we bought AMD a lot earlier this year. We're probably going to add to that position in our portfolio on this pullback just because we want more weight. And we bought a very small position. We want to bring that weight up. Um, there's some other stocks that we've been kind of you know buying into as, as things are improving. So that's just going to be kind of our process. But NVIDIA, we, we owned last year. It was up 100%. We sold it there thinking we were really smart. Apparently, we weren't. So you know, now we've got to wait for an opportunity to try to buy it back. Yeah. Um, so this is where uh, I've really got to get better at bringing some behavioral economists here onto the program, um, because this this psychology part is really important. Um, and uh, folks that aren't aware that the field of behavioral economics, which is a relatively new field, actually, its goal is to sort of munge together the quantitative side of of economics and the human nature side of just humans making investing decisions. Um, And actually, I've got one guy, uh, Dan Ariely, uh, who's a very um, well-known behavior economist, uh, who has basically said, yeah, I'll I'll come on. I just need to follow up with him to lock that down. So this is a good reminder of me to try to lock Dan in. Um, I also should get Peter Atwater back on, too, because he's all about sentiment. Yeah. So. 
uh, you know, if if psychology is in the driver's seat right now with the AI stocks, which I think we can make a good argument that it could very well be because they seem to be in a bubble. And you've, you've shown that chart earlier of comparing the rise in AI stocks to other price bubbles we've seen. And it sure looks like one. I mean, earlier stages than most, uh, but, but still uh, has that same look and feel. Um, I'll see if I can find the classic bubble chart here that, that shows all the different phases on the way up and then the phases on the way down. We can't say for certain that that's what's going to happen this time around, but if psychology is in the driver's seat, this is the the shape we would expect to see when this thing fully plays out. Um, and that, that's, the, and, and Adam, that's going to happen, right? I mean, again, you know, NVIDIA cannot, cannot, I don't care how much they sell, they cannot justify 40 times price to sales. Right. Trees don't grow to the moon, right? I mean, yeah. some, so, yeah. so, it's, so at some point, they're going to disappoint. The question is just when. I mean, but the stock could be 500% higher from here before they disappoint. That's the problem with bubble markets, which is all rationality gets priced out of stocks. Valuations, fundamentals simply don't matter during a mania phase. And we're in that phase. But but eventually, fundamentals are going to matter for these companies. You know, and I, and I find something really fascinating. You'll remember uh, two years ago, everybody was chasing Facebook stock meta because they were going into the metaverse, right? Oh, it's the metaverse. Everything's going to be metaverse. When was the last time you heard about the metaverse, right? It's all about artificial intelligence now. Metaverse is dead. <laughs> you know, that's, that's uh, which I think is going to be a real problem potentially for Facebook. Uh, meta, sorry, I'm, I'm old, so I still refer to everything as Facebook. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a problem for Meta because they're dumping a ton of money into this metaverse. And now Apple's come to market with this new $3,700 VR headset that they're probably going to take a big chunk of that market away from Meta. So Meta has been running up on this whole idea. It's been running with this AI bubble. But I think Meta's got a real problem down the road of just the fact that the metaverse probably never had the legs that artificial intelligence does on its own, just looking at the, the two separate bubbles. And I think that money migration to AI may be a problem for meta and its current and, and, and you know, kind of its business model going forward. We'll see. Um, I, I don't know anything for certain, but it is interesting, you know, that whole, that whole talk train of everybody, it's the meta, it's the meta, it's the metaverse. We're all gonna be in the metaverse. We're all gonna be, you know, Spider-Man in the metaverse. I haven't heard anything about that in a while. It's all about AI and chat GPT and what it's going to do for the labor markets and our jobs and all that. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. And it's interesting. You raise a couple of things there. One is um, what we talked about this last week, and it was uh, Jim Bianco uh, yep. who uh, brought all this up, was that, um, you know, oftentimes, or I want to say oftentimes, but but history has lots of examples where the market sussed out the potential of a new technology and did the math and said, wow, this is this could unlock, you know, a, a tremendous amount of incremental new value. And they pulled that value into the share price today. And then it took a decade or two for that value to actually be realized in the companies. And so you had a lot of stocks that were kind of dead stocks walking for a decade or more, where it took that long to to for the underlying earnings and everything of the company to finally rise the share price back up to where it justified the price that people were getting in at, at time zero. Right. Yeah. So that may be something that's happening here. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention on this topic was just, if you don't feel like you really have a deep understanding or a, a good enough understanding of what AI is. And, and I would say uh, a prudent investor today should at least have a working understanding of what it is for the potential that it has to disrupt and transform a number of sectors of the economy. You don't have to be an expert in it. You don't have to be a, a techno wonk, but you should have just sort of a general understanding of you know, the advantages and some of the potential pitfalls this new technology offers. Um, I did an interview earlier this week with Dylan Patel really just trying to provide a layman's understanding of what we're all talking about when we're talking about AI. If you haven't watched that, um, highly rec I'll put up a link to it here, but I highly recommend that you go watch that after this video here. Um, one of the things he mentioned, which I didn't know because I, I hadn't really been following AI super closely before that conversation was that Facebook has its own AI engine, uh, something yeah. called Llama. Um, so they're not, they're not, not in the AI game. Um, you know, uh, and Dylan mentioned that I'm not going to try to murder the differentiations he made <laughs> by the different companies that are out there right now, but right now Microsoft's got 
uh, chat GPT that's doing that in partnership with OpenAI. Google's got Bard, uh, but now Facebook's got its its own solutions that it's working on. Um, one of the things I find was kind of interesting about this, and, and again, folks, go watch the discussion with Dylan for the real skinny, but is that we call it artificial intelligence, but the type of AI we're talking about right now, particularly generative AI, which is like what chat GPT is, it's not intelligent. You know, there, there's, there's, there's not, um, it's not smart. It doesn't know what it's doing. It's basically just executing instructions that it's been told to follow. Um, right. What makes it different from previous incarnations is uh, it's a brute force approach, but it's a brute force approach at a scale that we just really couldn't have comprehended before. Um, and Dylan had this really interesting comparison. Again, I'm not going to get it right, but it was like, imagine imagine a sheet of paper like this. And I think he said it has like 20 neurons on it. If you could stack these pieces of paper on top of each other with these neurons, the first version of chat GPT was like a stack like that going from New York to Chicago. The next iteration was um, going to the moon and back, right? That's how that's how big the leap was in technology. So the current one that we're all using is going back into the moon and back 22 times, right? And he said, there's actually a fourth one that's already sort of in the works. Uh, it just hasn't been publicly re released. That's going to be an even, you know, commensurate magnitude of increase. And of course, this will continue to to, to grow like that. So it 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 the, the power here gets bigger and bigger. And there's lots of opportunities here to disrupt. But it's not it's not like oh, this is going to be necessarily yet Skynet that's going to be figuring out how to actually be smarter than humans and building its own robots and taking over the planet. Maybe at some point it will. And he he did open the door to say, look, I, there are nights I, I I don't go to sleep very easily. <laughs> but but right now the the current incarnations of AI that we're dealing with, it's not a true intelligence. No, it's not. In fact, I wrote an article on this. It's, uh, you know, it was out last week, which is basically titled AI may face some challenges. And in that article, uh, if I would suggest you put a link, you know, uh, to that article, you know, here for our conversation as well, because in that in that article is a link to Roger McNamee, who's probably one of the premier Silicon investors in technology, Silicon Valley investors in technology. And had a great interview with him on CNBC talking about AI. And, and precisely to your point, he said, look, all this thing does is there's this knowledge base sitting out here on the Internet. So all that's happening right now is, is that the artificial intelligence saying, OK, here's the question. Let me go over here. And let me examine this database of knowledge that's sitting out there in the Internet. And then I'll give you an answer. Well, the problem is, is the vast, you know, there's a huge pile of junk on the internet, false information, bad information, you know, just, you know, complete lies, fabrications, et cetera. You know, that, as he said, everything on the internet is not necessarily true. So, but it's grabbing that knowledge. So the problem is, is that you've got, as he, and to quote him, he's got, you've got BS coming in, which means you get BS coming out of it as well. And so it's not artificial intelligence if you've got to fact check the artificial intelligence. And that's his problem. That, that's his kind of thesis is that this is very early. This is basically, if you think about the life cycle of anything, we're still in embryo phase. We're, we haven't even started forming gills yet. So this has got a long ways to go before artificial intelligence becomes a real thing where you have robots basically thinking for themselves and doing this, right? Skynet, so to speak. Um, but they are attaching flamethrowers to robots, which is very troubling. So if you aren't yeah. worried about Skynet, I mean, we are moving in that direction. But. There's also a video clip out there in China where the Chinese military is delivering robot dogs with machine guns via drone. So they're literally yeah. dropping it into a hotspot and then the, the dog just wakes up and he swivels his machine. I mean, it, it, it yeah. does look like something out of uh, Black Mirror. Yeah, um, um, but but so but but in that but again that article covers and again that that interview with Roger McNamee is well worth listening to if if you're interested if you're interested in AI, you know everybody just jumped onto this band. Look, AI has been around for a decade. This is nothing new. Um, you if you have an Apple phone, you've got Siri. That's artificial intelligence, right? If you've got um, you know uh, an Android phone, you've got Bixby. That's artificial intelligence. So it, that's we've had artificial intelligence. The market was dying for something to grab onto. The market was just needing something positive to grab onto because for 18 months, it's been nothing but negative news, bank failures and recession and recession, recession everything's a recession and dollars. 
going to crash and you know the world's coming to an end it's just horrible and we got this current administration that absolutely sucks we got inflation man the market just needed something positive to grab onto so when it found ai even though ai has been around for a decade it was like that's it and man money needed a place to go and so money chased ai but it doesn't mean that this is really here yet. It's just, just a very fledgling investment we're, we're chasing. You know, I, I agree. And look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an AI uh, evangelist by any stretch. Um, but um, yeah, we've had AI and incarnations of it for decades, really, to your point. Um, but I think there has been a sea change transformation okay. here in terms of its utility. And I, I don't want to underplay my layman's understanding of, of the impact this is going to have. Now, is it going to cure cancer tomorrow? You know, no, <laughs> probably. Um, not the healthcare but, companies. Have to do with it. Pardon me. Not if the healthcare companies have anything to do with it. It yeah, won't cure. Whole different topic. <laughs> um, but uh, but but I think I, I do think, like I said, I think every prudent investor needs to develop an understanding of the basics of how this technology works and and what to expect in terms of the impact it's going to have on uh, the economy. Because I think it is going to be substantial. Oh. And there are going to be elements that are going to hit relatively soon. There are going to be some other ones that are going to be years, decades down the road, for sure. But as I said earlier, too, the pace of uh, the improvements here, uh, the progress here are, are, are honestly oh. probably happening at a pace that our human brains can't fully fathom, oh. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, it's, it's and, and look, chat GPD is just the first. And again, this is why the markets are jumping on. And all of a sudden, again, we've had this forever. But now all of a sudden there's this product, ChatGPT, and people are going, wow, look, I can have it write a book for me and I can have it write poems and I can have it write a resume and I can have it do all these things. And this is the first utility of artificial intelligence that people can really kind of latch onto. And trust me, open up TikTok and see how many things you get on AI of people telling you how to make a million dollars now with AI. It's just all over the place. But the important thing is, is that, look, this is going to impact your life, right? Just like the internet changed our lives, just like the telephone changed our lives, just like mobile phones changed our lives. This is going to change your life. Doesn't this, just like the internet, there were vast promises of wealth and riches that were promised to be made by the internet back in the late 90s that just did not come to fruition because of competition, cost reductions, those type of things. But it doesn't mean it didn't change our lives. Can you imagine, you know, my kids can't fathom a period of time where you didn't have the internet, right? So when my wife and I talked to our kids about growing up with no, you know, a house phone that was a landline and there was no internet, you had to actually read a book to, to go to school. That's, they can't fathom that. It's just, it's just too disconnected from them. And our next generation of kids and the kids after that, they're going to, they, they're not going to be able to fathom a time when you didn't have AI helping you do it just about everything. Look, we're we're right now building an AI program to put into SimpleVisor to help you pick stocks better. So, you know, everything that you're going to be doing is going to have AI involved with it somewhere down the road. Right. Which is why I'm saying, you know, folks should start developing an understanding of it now, because sort of trying to just ignore it, it would be the equivalent of like trying to ignore the Internet when it came along. Right. The other thing, too, just to beat this horse fully dead is the <laughs> path, the, the, the pace of adoption is getting faster and faster in every one of these technological cycles, right? And um, I'll put up a chart here I saw recently. It's comparing chat GPT adoption to other digital uh, platforms, but it shows that, you know, chat GPT hit a million users faster than any other, you know, digital technology uh, it had previously, right? And I think that's sort of the process that we're, we're going in here. And look, you know, talking to Dylan, um, again, he is a more or less an evangelist, you know, a, a true AI evangelist. Um, he he puts its impact somewhere, I think he said, between the development of the internet on the low end and the development of the internal combustion engine on the high end. He said it's going to be that kind of impact on the economy. But even he said, look, stocks are just crazy priced right now. They've gotten way ahead of themselves, right? So it, it's that delta between, you know, when the actual value is delivered uh, versus the, the hype of the moment, right? Um, real quick, too, before we move on this, you're, you're making me think um, I should probably try to reach out to Roger McNamee, uh, not because I know him, but uh, the, the woman, my wife's very good friend who introduced my wife and I, uh, her husband, when, when she made that introduction, was actually working for Roger McNamee at uh, Integral Capital Partners back then. Uh, her husband now has his own fund. But uh, he might be able to get Roger to come on in and, and maybe awesome. we could have a conversation with him about AI. I'll bring you into that if you want to. I would love to. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. 
Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, look, enough about AI. Um, let's get back to, to your partner, Michael Leibowitz's um, post here on interest rates. And, and, and real quick, I just want to get there through something you mentioned earlier, uh, which was the, um, the talk uh, that uh, Pal just had over in Europe um, with uh, several other uh, European central planners. So I know Christine Lagarde uh, was on that panel. I think a few other central bankers were. Um, but Powell did, as you said, he reiterated that, hey, we're going to need to keep tightening here. Um, and he said that he doesn't see U.S. core inflation getting to 2% this year or next. Yeah. Right. So that's him, I think, really trying to quell the enthusiasm that the market keeps you know, trying to rage on with here and saying, like, guys, you just don't get it. I am going to be I'm going to be more hawkish for a lot longer than you guys are currently pricing in. Right. right. So that you, gets us to oops, go ahead. Real quick, real quick, though, before you jump off that point, because this yeah. is this, this is an important point that, you know, and we've talked about this before, but th uh, this is this is a point worth reiterating before we talk about yield curves, because they, they play a part and parcel with each other. The Federal Reserve is hiking interest rates to slow the economy. And by slowing the economy, how do you slow the economy by hiking rates, right? You make things too costly in terms of either financing or expenditures or costs that people can track their spending. That's 70% of consumption, right? So it comes, sorry, 70% 70, 70 of GDP is consumption. Yeah. So if I'm going to slow the economy, I need to have a negative impact on consumers. Well, the problem with the market and this is a problem for the Fed. The problem with the market rallying like a banshee this year is that people are going, oh, wow, I have more money, right? Mm -hmm. my, my 401k is up. My stock portfolio is up. I, you know, I bought, you know, I'm buying call options on AC Ducey company and I'm making a thousand percent a day, you know, whatever. And so there's all this extra money. So they're going out in, into the economy and spending money. That's keeping economic growth elevated. That's also going to keep prices elevated. That's going to keep inflation from falling as much. And, and here's the important thing. Ben Bernanke back in 2010 said when he was launching quantitative easing part two. So we've done quantitative easing one coming out of 2009. He stopped it. The market sold off about 20% that summer. Ben Bernanke comes in. Hey, we're going to do QE2. The reason we're doing it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, is that Higher asset prices will boost consumer confidence, which will lead to stronger economic growth. And that's absolutely right. That's that wealth effect that we talk about quite often from the markets. If I can lift asset prices, I make people feel wealthier, so they'll go spend money in the economy. The problem for the Fed is that's easing monetary conditions. It's actually worth the market is working against the Fed, and the Fed's going, hey, guys, I've got to keep tightening rates because if you keep doing this, you're going to increase economic growth. And I, there's data supporting this right now. You're going to increase economic growth. That's going to cause inflation to start to rise again. And we can't, that's the thing we can't tolerate is having a resurgence of inflation. But the market is driving exactly that. If you take a look at consumer confidence, and I run a, a composite index, and this was in last week's newsletter on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com, talking about consumer confidences. Consumer confidence is rising. And when consumer, there is a high correlation between consumer confidence changes and economic growth. And what it's saying right now is this, sir, this, this increase in consumer confidence is going to keep economic growth. And when we should start seeing a lot of these economic data points like the LEI and others bottom and start to turn up here in the next quarter, the, if consumer confidence keeps going up because of their actions in the economy. And this is, again, this is exactly the opposite of what the Fed wants. So this is right. putting the Fed in a really bad position to where they're going to have to not only, but they may have to wind up hiking rates more than two times if the market is better. Yep. No, I agree. So I really appreciate you underscoring that. And again, we've talked about forever, but, you know, that then, that, that then raises the question even more prominently of, Okay, well, what of the lag effect? Right? You know, if if we still have the preponderance of the impact of the lag effect from everything that's already been done, but the Fed is deciding in the near term, I got to be even more extreme, right? You, you, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you you definitely increase the risk of the Fed doubling down into tightening just as the lag effect starts hitting, and then we find out, dear Jesus, we really over tightened. You know, when we when we look back over the scope of history. Um, 
who knows, we'll see that has yet to be written. But certainly, as you and I talked about, um, seeing, uh, having those concerns, right, looking at the market and saying, guys, you're, you're undoing everything I'm trying to do here. Then seeing GDP get revised in Q1 as substantial as it was, of course, the Fed is like, okay, that's not good, right, from what we're trying to do. As you and I have said, from the base effect math alone, CPI is likely to start going up over the summer, right? That's going to just look optically bad and just add fuel to the fire already on the same issue. And so, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, 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 I understand. And, and the weirdest thing is, is, is that Powell keeps saying, because of all this stuff, market, I am going to have to be the responsible, strict adult in the room. And the market is just saying, ah, I don't care. You know, I either don't believe you or it doesn't matter. I think I think it's more of a I don't believe you. Well, actually, it's not I don't believe you. The market is running on this basis, which is, hey, I get it. You're hiking rates, but you're going to be cutting rates. And, and, and since you're going to cut rates, I want to be in there before you cut rates, because once you cut rates, that means the markets are really going to take off. So all these investors are piling into the market expecting rate cuts. But here's my question to you, Adam, and you can ask this question to any of your other panelists that you have on here. Why would the Fed cut rates if economic growth is 2%, inflation is falling or at least flat? You know, it's not going up dramatically, but maybe it's not coming down to 2%. If the consumer is doing fine, right, and interest rates aren't causing, you know, bank failures or anything else, then why would I cut rates? There's, you know, I would just leave rates where if I was the Fed, I'd just right. leave well, rates. And that's what the Fed rate. is saying it's going to do. Yeah. It's saying we don't have any rate cuts on our horizon. But the markets are going, no, I, I don't believe you. You're going to be cutting rates like next month. And but so what's so interesting about that is, is first off, the mark, this has been a game of chicken for getting close to a year now. And the Fed has won every game so far, right? The market has had to say, oh, okay, yep, I guess you're not going to cut this early. Okay. And yet stock prices have been marching higher all along, right? Which is crazy making uh, in and of itself. But, you know, every recession, usually where the Fed has, you know, typically tightened going into the recession, then the recession hits, then the Fed starts uh, cutting. There's usually a couple quarters of, of cutting as the market continues to go down before it finds its bottom. So I find it a little crazy making that the market is saying, oh, I'm pricing in your cuts because as soon as you cut, it's happy days again. It's like, no, no, no. History shows us it's not. Well, you know, there there is an interesting, there is a, you know, I'm not saying this time is different, but there is a difference this time, which is normally. <laughs> and, 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 oh, I'm so glad you're not saying this time. I'm not saying this time. Look, I'm not, what I'm saying is, is I'm not saying this time is going to be different than the past, but there is a difference going into this, which is that previously when the Fed was hiking rates, the market was going up during the rate hikes because there was a lot of momentum behind the market. The economy was very strong and the Fed's going, hey, I'm hiking rates because the economy is too strong. It's overheating and the markets are going, to, don't believe you. Earnings are growing, so I'm gonna I'm I'm investing in stocks. So as interest rates are going up, the market is going up with with the market, and then the Fed breaks something, right? And they stop hiking rates, and then the market realizes, oh crap, you broke something. Oh, there's a recession coming in, and now earnings are falling and prices fall during the rate cuts. The difference this time is that the market declined as the Fed was hiking rates. Now. Interestingly enough, the market has recovered every bit of loss from the first rate hike back in March of last year. The, 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 we've been, it seems like we've been talking about this forever. It was just March of last year, the Fed hiked rates for the first time for a quarter basis point, and we're now back to that level. We've priced out or priced in every, every rate hike since last year. So the markets are going, hey, this, this is all over. Earnings have bottomed, right? We've had an earnings decline last year. And, and what the, the market's betting on now is that earnings have now declined, uh, a bottom. They're going to start improving going into this year or next year. And, you know, the, the question is, is if we're going to have a recession. Now, if we do have a recession, the economy slows more, then earnings should decline. So this pricing issue is going to have to get priced. The, the market will have to reprice for lower earnings. If we get into a recessionary spat, but again, we haven't, we haven't, you know, everybody's been expecting recession. We haven't gotten there yet. Doesn't mean we won't, but because of all that liquidity that we slammed into the market, it's has basically screwed up everything <laughs> temporarily. So all these indicators are off and this lag effect is taking longer to show up than, than anybody kind of banked on. So we'll see what happens, but you know, the, one of the, the things that we've got to work on 
is how much did that previous did, did, did last year's 20% decline take care of in the overall decline? So is there 10% downside to go or is there another 20 or 30? I don't have the answer for that. Yeah, I, I don't either. And it's good for you to raise. I have personally have a hard time with the sort of like, a, well, the market pre-crashed or pre-corrected and, and we don't have to worry because we were at such ridiculous valuation extremes at the end of 2021, right? That was, we could have made an argument in 2019 that the market was way too far overvalued, but then we had all the crazy stimulus of the pandemic. So it's, 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 it begs the question of, well, what happened to just letting all the crazy steam of all the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, stimulus uh, out of the system. So anyways, that, that's why I have trouble saying, oh, we, we reached some sort of fair value in advance here. But who knows? I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I don't like, like I said, I don't have the answer either. I don't know how this works out, uh, you know, and this is now, now this is the time. Having said that, this is the time to now start talking about Michael's article, because, you know, this lag effect is, like I said, taking much longer to show up in the economy. And so because it's taking long, longer to show up, everybody's going, well, I guess it's not going to come. But we've had, and, and everybody's like, see, we've had this inverted yield curve now for the last, you know, 12, 14, 15 months. It's not the yield curve inversion that tells you a recession's coming. It's when it uninverts that tells you the recession's coming. And right now, of the 10 economically sensitive indicators that we track in terms of yield curves, 100% of them are inverted. You have never not had a recession with 100% of those 10 yield curves inverted, but it's not the inversion that is the recessionary signal, it is the uninversion. So what will cause them to, to uninvert? That'll be a very steep drop in that two-year treasury note versus the 10-year bill. And that'll be because of a very sharp, sudden slowdown in economic growth. Hasn't happened yet because of all liquidity, but maybe it's 2024, maybe it's 2025. But the, you know, the uninversion will occur, and that will likely be a function of a reset of interest rates much lower in the overall breadth of the, of, of the bond market. Um, so uh, you're right. And again, that's one of the reasons why we have you on the program every week. So as you see any change in those indicators, oh, you know, one just uninverted, you know, you can give our, our folks really early warning on this. Um, yeah, Michael, you know, mentioned is, is I think you're getting to here, which is that one of the reasons why it may very well be different this time is we had so much stimulus put out there, so much pig put in the Python to use our common vernacular. Um that it has been acting as this buffer, right? That has sort of slowed down the arrival of what we might otherwise expect. And it has been distorting things, you know, as, as that much liquidity is passing through the system. He had one chart in there that I thought was really interesting, um, which was a chart of, of expectation beats on non-farm payrolls. Yep. And he said that that is, you know, it's, it's, it's an estimate by the market, right? And so generally the market's either it's going to beat the market's estimate or it's going to disappoint versus the market estimate. And it it should have about a 50-50 track record, right, of that, which it has in the data set, except for the last 14 months, which have all been beats. And he says it's kind of the equivalent of coming up heads 14 times in a row with a coin, right? And that's just a good example of how that much liquidity can really distort the system. It can keep the good times going for a lot longer than people might otherwise expect. I do want to put one asterisk next to that, just because you and I have had so many discussions about how much we can really trust uh, that payroll data. So that might be playing a little bit of a role here. But still, you just look at that chart and very clearly it shows you that something is very different about right now. Well, I mean, you know, the, the 14 beats in a row is a record by miles of any other period in history of beats, consecutive beats of estimates. So, you know, either everybody's sandbagging the numbers or just nobody believes anything anymore. I, I'm not sure which is happening. So, but- Right, well, the, or to the, Michael's the, point, you know, the, the, there's just so much money passing through the system that the jobs market has held up way better than anybody thought it could, right? And again, you know, it's also the quality of the jobs, you know, right? Where, where are most of these jobs still being created, yeah. right? It's temporary jobs, it's jobs, and, and unfortunately, you know, a big chunk of big chunk of the job creation is held by foreign born citizens versus native born citizens. That's not really great for our economy either. So, you know, there, there's a lot of funky things going on because of the shutdown of the economy, the restarting of it, all this liquidity. 
you know, there's, you know, certainly, you know, but, but that's going to work itself out over time. The question is just how long does it take for that to actually start to work itself out? And I don't know the answer to that. All right. Um, one other thing that Michael talked about in the argument in his article, and, and you know, by the way, basically says, look, you know, yield curves predict recessions, um, and uh, you know, yield curves are we're basically looking at the yield on on credit, and one of the th the reasons why credit is even more important today uh, than perhaps it has been in any other cycle is we just have so damn much of it now, right? And so. Um, there was a stat there that that really caught my attention, which is that we, we've now got so much debt out there, uh, and so much of it has been priced at a low uh, yield up until now. Said each one percent increase in interest rates result in interest expenses rising two point seven six percent of GDP. Yeah. That compares to just zero point seven five percent in two thousand. So there's yeah. a full two hundred basis points. Of of GDP that we basically lose every time interest rates go up by a percent. Right, and, and look, and, and one of the things that we talked about this last week, you know, one of the things that's been adding a lot of money to the system to keep the economy floating is that nobody's been having to pay student loan debt, but that's about to restart. So that's another drag. So now you have higher interest rates. Uh, household debt is is remarkably higher than it was where in the 1980s, and so to, to Michael's point. You know, the whole if you strip out the debt, right? So if you take a look at economic growth X debt, we would have had negative economic growth for the last 25 years, right? So, you know, in other words, if you at the function of debt and that consistently lower interest rate that allowed us to take on more and more debt is a vast contributor to what's been keeping economic growth going, although, as we talked about before debt leads to lower rates of economic growth because of that withdrawal of money from productive investment into debt service. So this is why we continue to chug along at 2%. But had it not been for those steady increases in debt, government, household, corporate, et cetera, we wouldn't have had any real economic growth at all. But again, that's just kind of where it is. But now with interest rates going up, this is going to make debt service higher, which is going to detract more money from economic growth in the future. So far, it's been OK because everybody's been able to tap on to you know, stimulus or be extra benefits or not paying a student loan, not paying a mortgage, not paying rent. We have rent moratoriums, we have mortgage moratoriums, all nine yards. So a lot of people have had extra money at their, at their disposal that's now virtually going away. So we may see a little bit of catch up here over the next six months to a year. Well, all right. So a couple of things. One, um, I'm really looking forward to talking to Lacey Hunt again. And, and just a quick plug, um, he'll be keynoting Wealthion's um, uh, fall conference in October. Um, but he's also going to come on the program uh, in July. And, you know, Lacey, uh, a master of economic data and from his previous presentations, has shown how um, the economic growth we get from taking on debt um, has been declining over the past number of decades. Uh, and of course, you get to a point where you don't get any growth for the debt you take on and debt just becomes an anchor, right? And I can't remember where the the, the ratio was the last time I saw his chart. I just remember it wasn't very good. <laughs> but this dramatic increase in interest rates that we've seen, I think just yeah. compromises that number, you know, dramatically more, right? Yeah. Um, and just to just to kind of put a point on this is, you know, Lance, you know this, like businesses, if, if you're if you're a business and you're going to take out a loan, you go to a bank and that bank gives you a loan based on the prime rate, right? You're going to get prime, prime plus whatever, right? Um, the prime rate is eight and a quarter right now. So if you get a really generous loan of like prime plus one, you're still at over 9%. Yeah. I mean, that is a way different world than we lived in just a year and a half ago, right? And there's Bankruptcies go recently, uh, really sharp uptick in bankruptcies. I think that'll continue. Uh, next year, we're going to get into a big uh, kind of debt wall that is going to require refinancing for smaller mid-cap companies. And there's a lot of companies that simply, they've been surviving on cheap debt. And all of a sudden, they have to refinance debt at 7 8 9%. Um, that's going to be a very different world for them in terms of cash flows and you know liquidity and those type of things. So 
you know, there's there's still a, a lot of risk from higher interest rates as we go in further into this year and, and into next year. And again, that's that lag effect. We just haven't got to the point that those refinancing have had to occur at a much higher rate and, and companies balk at it. But we're also knowing that, that uh, lending standards are tightening up, which is limiting people from getting access to credit because they simply don't qualify. And, and does this make you think, this is kind of what it makes me think, but I'd, I'd love to hear if you think differently, is that if we do go into harder economic times ahead from here, it's going to be kind of like a Hemingway inverted exponential curve, right? Where it's it was slowly and then all at once, right? Where like, as more and more companies start hitting this maturity wall, that's how um, Michael right. Green referred to it earlier this week. And he was saying he, he, he sees 2024 and 2025 as having a massive maturity wall for a lot of companies. Um, that are existing right now on on the debt that they raised before the interest rates started getting hiked. Um, so you know, just just as we go along the time curve, we're just going to have a higher and higher percentage of the economy that slams into this maturity wall and has to refinance at these higher rates, and then just you know, that just becomes an exponentially increasing depressive force on economic growth. And, and that's look, and that's and so let's step all this back for a moment, right? So you know, we're talking about a bull market. And now we're talking about all this really negative stuff. So people are going, well, Lance, I don't understand what's going on. You're saying it's a bull market. And then you're talking about all this negative stuff. So why do I want to be in the market when it's all going to crash? Um, you know, the thing about markets is, is that market, and this is what's been happening over the last year, markets price in all of this. So the stuff that we're talking about right now, the market knows about. This isn't stuff that the market really hasn't factored in too much. I think the one thing that maybe the market hasn't factored in too much is this restart of student loan payments. There's not been a lot of talk about it, not a lot of headlines about it. So I don't think anybody's really kind of factored into earnings potential, um, you know, just how big of a hit it may be when people have to start paying, you know, $300 more a month into student loan debt versus buying stuff. We'll see. I could be entirely wrong. It may be priced into markets. But, you know, what will get the market, and this, and this is the thing. So what would cause the next bear market? Or the next, or forget even a bear market. Just say another ten percent downturn in the market. So let's just. Can I give the answer? Because I think I've talked to you enough to know. Go ahead. It's going to be what the market is not thinking about right now. It'll be an exogenous. It'll be an ex unexpected exogenous event, and so that's that's the thing. It's got to be something the market has not thought about yet. It it won't be a debt wall, right? What it could be though is all of a sudden a massive rush of bankruptcies. Of companies, may, you know, maybe the market is expecting the debt wall, but we're going to resolve it somehow, and all of a sudden you have a massive surge in bankruptcies. That maybe, maybe that's it, or you know, potentially, you know, you have, you know, we just had bank stress test out this week, right? The Fed says every one of our banks passed the stress, even Credit Suisse, which yep. just failed, passed the credit, <laughs> passed their stress test. Um, you know, and and you know, the stress tests are completely bullshit. Uh, sorry, bogus. Um, because every time there's a problem, we have to, we just had to bail out banks, right? We just had to bail out Credit Suisse and, you know, force a merger, uh, with Credit Suisse. We just had to, to provide a, a credit line for banks, you know, through the Federal Reserve so they could get access to, to loans against collateral because they were going to go out of business. They didn't, but they're all fine, by the way. Right. You but know, now they, they're all A students. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they've all passed their stress test. It's complete crap, but it's all to make you feel better, right? So this and the whole goal of these stress tests, everybody knows what's going on with the banks. They're not well capitalized. They, if they were, we wouldn't be having problems. They're not well capitalized. It's a bunch of hooey, but we have these stress tests to make you feel better. So you go, well, my bank's on the list and it's well capitalized. It's not. It's just a function of time until something breaks in the system. And even JP Morgan is going to wind up in trouble at some point and need another bailout. I don't know what's going to cause that, but that's the event you're looking for. It'll be some type of credit-related event in the markets that the market's not planning on and hasn't been pricing in. All of a sudden, it pops up overnight and the market goes, oh, crap, I've now got to reprice everything, right? All my expectations for earnings were here. They're now here. I've got to reprice the market for that. That's what causes these big declines in the markets. And that's the, unfortunately, we will never know what that is because if we start talking about it, the market's pricing it in. Right, if we, we increase the it, odds of getting priced in. Right, right. It's just, well, that's just the way the markets work. Markets are, right. are seeing all this and they're going, okay, what's the risk? That risk is pretty low, so I'm going to bypass that one. This risk is pretty high, so we'll have a little bit of a sell-off here and we'll price that in. But that's just how the markets work.
Yeah. So it's funny you cut, you, you hit a few other, my bullets here. Um, just on this point, I, I just want to note, and I'm, I'm, I'm very deliberately not putting a political spin on any of this, but just in the past week, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> please don't, we got enough comments about your opining on the climate last time around. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you really just in the past week, right, we had uh, a coup attempt in Russia, yep. right, we had, um, uh, we, we had uh, former President Trump, uh, you know, basically, uh, tapes come out that that seem to be quite undermining of his legal defense right now. Um, and then we've had uh, sort of similarly on, on the Biden side, uh, we've had additional data come out that is putting he and his son in, in, in more compromising hot water than they've been in so far on, you know, dealings that they've done in the past with, with state agencies. And again, I'm, I'm really trying not to put a political spin on any of this, but I'm just saying, like, those are probably at least grace ones, right? And so, like, we, we're in this environment where we could wake up in the morning and, and find, you know, a, a headline that is pretty game changing. Um, yeah. And we're, we're, we're seeing some, you know, near examples of that right now. So I love your thoughts on that. But also, too, did the market, like, dodge a bullet here? Like, in other words, if this coup in Russia hadn't been wrapped up in 48 hours, could the markets have had a very different week this week? Yeah, you know, potentially, uh, you know, because again, that's something that certainly the markets didn't expect. And I, and I love the fact that, you know, I saw your tweet. It was like, yeah, that happened right after I just finished up taping with Lance. We'll talk about it next week. And yeah. then like 30 minutes later, it was over, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, you didn't get to talk about it. But yeah, you know, look, that's going to be the thing that, uh, again, that undermines the markets. It's, you know, all this stuff, whether, you know, whether it's climate change or whether it's the president, you know, there, all that is in the headlines already. I mean, we've been talking about Biden and, and Hunter and all that crap for a year and a half. We've been talking about, look, they've been trying to find something to, to you know, to, to get Trump on so he won't run for president. Right. But, but, but my, my point is one of those might land, right? We might, we yeah, might take even, players off the table. Putin, right. Trump, Biden, whoever they could. Yeah. could be. And, but again, that's been in the headlines for so long. Everybody goes like, yeah, I know. Uh, not surprised. It, see, it's got to be something. Um where you wake up tomorrow morning and all of a sudden there is a game changing event that changes the economic potential in the country, right? If right. Because Biden- it, it's going to be the credit markets that drive this change at the end. Right. So if Biden was in, let's just say we wake up tomorrow, Biden's in peace, right? That's not going to affect the credit markets. Everybody's going to look at it and go, well, not surprised. Um, or Trump, you know, is convicted and and sentenced to ten years in prison. Okay, the Sanders runs for president now. So okay, got it. See, those don't change the economic dynamics. You're going to make one group of people really happy one way or the other, whichever you know, whichever outcome it is. But that's not going to change the consumption or spending behaviors of of individuals, and it's not going to change the credit market. In other words, where bank the thing you're looking for is the event that occurs where banks go. I'm not lending any money to anybody until that problem is solved. And when you stop the lifeblood of the system, which is the credit market, that's when everybody has to reprice. Because once you stop credit, all of a sudden, as a business, I can't borrow money to create more revenue, to create my sales, to market whatever I'm going to do. So earnings are going to come down because of that. And that means I have to reprice whatever the price of the market is to this new earnings level. So that's why a lot of these political events, and I, and I tell you this all the time here on, on the show, it's like everybody's worried about, oh, if the dollar is going to do this or, you know, yeah, we may de-dollarize in the next hundred years, maybe, possibly, but that is such a long-term event that it's going to have nothing to do with the markets right now. What you're looking for is some event you wake up to in the morning that, that changes the game for the credit and the ec- economic environment that we live in today. And that's going to be something that you and I are not talking about. I have no idea what it's going to be. Okay. Uh, I hope we don't have to find out in anytime soon, but you never know. <laughs> It'll happen. No, it, it, look, it's going to happen. And, and we're, and, and you and I'll be sitting here on a Friday going, well, you know, I hate to say that I didn't see it coming, but nobody could have seen that coming. Right. Yep. It, it's just it, because it'll be something. And, and I, I can't even fathom what it would be. Um, you know, we, we, nobody fathomed that 2008, that, the Federal Reserve and, and banks would force Lehman Brothers into bankruptcy. That 
you know, the market was just in the slow kind of bear market like we were in last year, just kind of this choppy little decline going down. And then one morning, well, <laughs> on a Saturday morning, we find out Lehman Brothers is now bankrupt and banks go, well, crap, if they just went bankrupt, I'm not lending money to anybody because I don't know who's going bankrupt next. Right, because you didn't know Everything what the contingent risk was. Right? Yeah. And that's where the markets just completely fell apart at that point and, and you had that major decline. So right, and, and, and I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I guess on this one, this is where you really have to hand to how they handled Credit Suisse. Yeah. Um, because- that was, a, uh, that was a potential bullet, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say, because that that was big enough that if it had just died overnight, right, you would have had a lot of banks saying, I don't know what my counterparty risk is here, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Credit Suisse had every potential to be the next Lehman. And that's why they were such, an, that's why all the central banks were in such a hurry to, to marry that thing off to UBS and get it out of the way. Because yeah. that was that was a real risk that we dodged that bullet on. Okay. Um all right. Well, I could I could continue peeling on this, but we got to move on. Um, but this is a good segue into my next question, which is um, so one one way to measure risk building in the um, the credit system is to look at yield spreads, right? Um, in particularly uh, high yield spreads versus treasuries, and man, those things are showing no worry at all right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the the you know you're not getting paid to take risk in bonds. Um, what I mean by that is, is that you're not really getting paid to a tremendous degree to take a bunch of risk in, you know, low quality junk bonds where you're taking on a potential bankruptcy risk. You're really not getting paid for that. Um, you get paid in very good, what we call money good bonds. You can get right now, you can make five, six, seven percent in good bonds that you don't have to worry about the bankruptcy risk on. So, but again, there's, you know, normally if, if we were getting into an environment where there was real risk, the, market, the spreads between junk bonds and A-rated bonds would be just blowing out because nobody would be wanting to take risk in, in the junk side. They all be piling into the, to the, to the uh, or safety side. And that's just not happening. People aren't scared of the markets right now. So, uh, so this is a really great point because um, I was going to ask too about VIX, right? And I had Sven Henrik on the program recently, and you know he follows VIX a lot. And uh, and I asked him directly, is VIX you know still a useful uh, indicator anymore? And he said, I don't know. He, he said that's a really good question. It, it just does not seem to be behaving anymore the way that it used to. It does not seem to be a good tracker of of uh, volatility anymore. And um, I'm just curious with with with, with high yield rates. We, we, we a couple of questions for you, but I guess the first one is is uh, is it a good transmis transmission mechanism right now for risk in the system, or are things just so complacent that it's like a false reading at this point? Well, so I'm actually so this weekend's newsletter, um, which will be at realinvestmentadvice.com, is actually talking about the VIX and this very high level of complacency that we have in the markets right now. And, you know, so, so first of all, if we just take a look at the VIX, you know, we're all looking at it and me included, right? Go, well, you know, it's just showing no signs of fear at all. But also there's been no volatility in the market. If, if you look at options markets, everybody's piling into call options. Puts are extremely cheap. Nobody's wanting to buy put protection in the market. Um, markets are going up, kind of just grinding higher all year this year. Uh, we have had a, we, we've now been in one of the longer stretches of the markets without a 3% correction. So there's been no volatility. So a very low volatility reading right now is, is should be expected. Um, I do touch on, there's certainly a different dynamic to this mark, to the volatility market right now in the options market, in particular because of these zero DT options, these zero date expiration options. And we certainly have to to, and those aren't and, and those options don't get measured by the VIX. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening, a much larger share of the option market that's trading in these zero data expiration options that aren't captured by the VIX index. So maybe um, the VIX is not as useful as it used to be, but there's also reasons why it's saying that we have low volatility right now is because we have low volatility. We have low volatility, yeah. So, so 
you know, I don't, uh, so I'm not arguing with, with, with Sven at all because I'm in the same camp with him. I don't know if it's broken or not. I'm watching it very carefully. It does right now jive with the fact that we have very low volatility and very high investor bullishness. That makes complete sense. I guess, but I mean, it had been kind of yeah. declining all through this yeah. year. Right. Even when folks were more nervous. Right. It just yeah. it just doesn't seem to be. So anyways, you, we'll, we'll all read your your article when it comes out tomorrow. Um, but but back to my question about the high yield space. Um, is there potential reason to believe like VIX that it might be compromised? Because, again, in the VIX case, like you said, there's zero DTE options that might be stealing some of the, the signaling power. Or is it literally just. It, it is. It, everything's fine. It, no, it's it's. I don't think it's a function of everything is fine in, in terms of that. Saying, I, in other words, what I don't think is happening in the high yield market is everybody's going. I'm buying high yield because everything is fine. This is my opinion only, so just take it for that. But after 12 years of Pavlov's bell, which is you know every time that something happened in the market. Ben Bernanke or Jay Powell comes out or yelling, come out, they ring the bell and throw money into the market. Investors have just been taught now classical conditioning, behavioral conditioning, that why not take on as much risk as I can get? Because if something goes wrong, I'm going to get bailed out. So why would I want a 4% coupon on a ultra safe, you know, risk-free treasury when I can get 9, 10, or 11% on a high yield junk bond. And if something goes wrong, just like we saw in March of 2020, the Fed's going to bail out high yield bonds, right? The but Fed that, is but are they paying that much right now? Is that, is, that the, is that the spread right now? No, no, no. No, there's bonds out there that you can buy. You know, you get down to the, you get down into the single B, double Bs, there's some pretty high yields. Okay. On there. All right. If you're scraping there's the also, barrel, but there's okay. also a really high, yeah, yeah. There's also a real high potential they're going to go bankrupt. But the point is, is that investors have been taught this and we are now, and look, this is why you have so many retail investors chasing options because I can leverage up my portfolio with a little bit of money. I can make a whole bunch of money in the options market. Works great till it doesn't and you lose a bunch of money. But, you know, while it's all working, it all works great. But we've just been teaching investors now for the last five years in particular, just take on as much risk as you can get because regardless of what happens, the Fed's going to bail you out. If something happens in the market, the Fed's going to jump in, cut rates to zero, and do QE. Everybody knows this. So why not take on as much risk as you can? All right. Well, let me ask you this. We're going to get to your trades in just a second. But when you look at the current uh, situation with yield curves right now, right, when the spreads are so tight, run a relative basis, um, and you look at all the stuff that we talked about, and yes, we might still be in a new bull market, and that could continue through the rest of the year, or... A lot of this macro stuff we've talked about could 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 happen. Do you do you feel any compelling compulsion to to try to trade these compressed yields right now? Um, on the on the bond side or the equity side? I'm thinking I'm thinking specifically on the bond side on the high yield. Yeah. No, no, we've been we've been we we're not chasing too much like super high yield right now. But no, we've been out in the markets buying you know corporate bonds. We bought a um, a six percent coupon issue the other day okay. from. Uh, from uh, Federal Home Loan Bank. So, I mean, there's some good yields out there. Well, they, sorry, let, let me ask my question differently. Th sorry. Th there are ways you can play the yield curve blowing out or, or at least increasing from where it is. Oh, okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, do you feel any compulsion to say, look, I, I think yields are so compressed right now that they've just got to start expanding even, even in a good economy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not yet. Um, you know, we're watching that very carefully. In fact, just this morning, we were doing some uh, work on mortgage-backed securities and mortgage REITs, those type of things, preferred stocks. Uh, we've actually been, from, been, been picking on some preferred stocks lately, just simply because if we start to get an uninversion of the yield curve and things start to go back to normal, uh, those areas will start to benefit in particular. So yeah, there's there's it, it's a little early right now to be trying to bank on that that outcome, but it's certainly getting to the position to where there are some opportunities on on the debt side of the market to where potentially we can make some pretty decent money over a fairly short time frame. Okay. Let, let's earmark to to talk about that more deeply on this program when you guys start. Well, I, time is near. I, so next week, uh, actually, I'm traveling. So Michael Leibowitz is going to fill in for me with you. So I think that'd be a good conversation piece with you. 
Okay, I'll, I'll mark it down with him. And since he is our res resident bond guru. Bond expert, yep. And he's going to be speaking at uh, our conference in October too. So yeah, on you never, you never, yeah, you never asked me to do that, but that's okay. Ask him. Bye. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wanted an expert. So I, of course, you know. I got you. That's a good really <laughs> fine. Um, all right. Well, look, um, I had a good rant here or an interesting one. Um, no time for it, though. Uh, no time as well to go in depth through your 15 rules. So um, I'll remind folks at the end of this video where they can go to download the list and we'll punt those both to next week. Real quick, before we get to your trades, I just want to put two data points out there. Um, one is on the consumer. Um, the latest consumer news I got that I thought was interesting was one uh, shares of Cheerios maker General Mills plunged the most in a year after new annual guidance indicated price hikes on ready-to-eat cereals and meat kits would no longer offset slowing sales as consumers pull back on spending. So we're, we're really beginning to see that the beginning of this demand destruction, the belt tightening at the, the majority end, the lower majority end of the consumer uh, spending spectrum. Uh, and I just want to compare that um, with on the high end of the consumer uh, spending spectrum, um, Rolex watches have hit their lowest price in the past two years, right? So, you know, two interesting data points, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, significant of a massive trend, um, but but this continued deterioration of consumer spending that you and I have been expecting, these are just road signs on the way there. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, and I think if, 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 you know, if student loan repayments start, you know, companies like Nike that sell very expensive shoes, um, I think they could see a real, you know, that, that, you know, those stocks have had some impact, but I think there's a lot more to go on some of these consumer kind of higher end consumer cyclical stocks, uh, especially some of the high end luxury retailers, et cetera, yeah. where you could potentially see a fairly decent contraction in spending as people opt to buy you know, from, you know, discounted retailers, et cetera. So I still think that shift is coming and particularly the retail discretionary space, you know, but we'll see. Well, we'll see. And this just to give a little peek into where I was going to go with the rant. Um, so I have to uh, go back East um, in two weeks uh, for my mother's uh, ceremony or ceremony of life. And, uh, you know, I'm from a small little town in Connecticut uh, where I mostly grew up and that's where she lived. And, uh, you know, we, just, we went on Airbnb and just trying to find a place to stay over there. The prices are insane. And, and this is not a place in the country where people spend generally hundreds of dollars a night, you know, for lodging. <laughs> and I mean, I just looked at the prices recently. Fortunately, my wife found something a little bit more affordable. But I mean, it's like we couldn't do any better than three or four hundred bucks a night. And I'm telling you guys, in the Tri-Town area, you know, in the Connecticut River Valley where I grew up, um, that's just bonkers, just absolute bonkers. And so I'm contrasting that with what we were just talking about, right? Because there's still, you know, I was mentioning how I was traveling uh, a week or two ago and like the airports are still full, you know, restaurants are still full and we're seeing all this data that is sh showing us in aggregate that people are really getting pinched understandably by this rising cost of living and, you know, 26 months straight of lower real wages and all that stuff. But yet it, the visible consumption just still seems to be powering through. Um, and there's a lot of interesting questions that that raises, which we'll hold off until we talk about this in more detail when you come back from your trip. So I guess we're talking two weeks from now. Um, but uh, but it is interesting that, that, and I'm hearing this from lots of other people too, right? It's like, I, I get the fact that the data is worsening, but geez, I'm still not seeing it in the real world. People are spending like drunken sailors still. Yeah, and, and, uh, they, but again, they, they have cash flow that they didn't have before. So that may change. Yeah. All right. Uh, last data point is just, oh, sorry, go ahead. And by the way, speaking of, you know, kind of that topic um, with your mom, I did talk to Richard and Danny and they'd be happy to go ahead and do a kind of an end of life planning uh, seminar uh, with you. So you just have to basically start kind of fleshing out if you want to do that. And, okay. But, I think the answer on that is yes, given folks' response in the comments from last time around. So I'll follow up with you before you go to get a date from those guys. And folks, we'll put a live webinar on the, the calendar that anyone who's interested in that. And again, this is for anybody who is uh, either has parents uh, that are aging and you're going to have to figure out, you know, what kind of medical care you're going to go through when they're their last chapter of life there. And then, of course, 
all the end of life issues that come up. Um, and if you're older and you just don't feel like you've got a great game plan or, or you want to include your family in creating one, that's why we're putting all this together. Um, all right, uh, last point, then we'll get to your trades. Uh, on the housing market side of things, we just had our second year-over-year -year price drop in the case Schiller Index. Um, these were the first and second price drops, I think, since 2012, um, so for a long time. Uh, and the magnitude is increasing. So the first price drop was negative 1.1% year-over-year. Now it's 1.7% year-over-year. Um, who knows where it goes from here? But if you look at you know the historical cycles, if we're entering a down cycle, which it certainly seems like we may be here, we should expect these numbers to get more and more negative over the next couple of months. You know, we were actually talking about that this morning, which there is an interesting issue that may come up when the Fed actually cuts rates, right? So, so far, the housing market really hasn't corrected as much as everybody thought it was going to. And in some areas it has, right? But kind of overall, it's holding in much better. And we just saw new housing sales have a fairly sharp increase recently. We've seen you know, home demand picking up, National Association of Home Builders getting more optimistic. And that's because of a function of this uh, problem where new home sales are coming in and their supply coming from new home builders, but the existing home supply isn't there because as, as older people, we're going, I can't sell my house and capture that gain I've got in it because I've got to go finance a house at six or 7% and my payments right. are too much. But here's the interesting dichotomy. The housing crash could actually come when you get the rate cuts because all of a sudden you cut rates, demand goes up and all those baby boomers go, here's my house. I have an opportunity to get out of it and get to a cheaper payment. And so we could see a massive supply of, of which would be interesting because normally it'd be just the opposite. But again, we've kind of screwed stuff so much up in our economy uh, because of holding rates at zero for way too long that we could theoretically see a flood of inventory coming into the market when rates are cut and boomers who are you know, getting need to downsize, et cetera, and have been able to, they rush to market and provide that supply. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, that is super interesting. And, and it is in one of the many ways that this time is different. Different, though, just doesn't necessarily mean better necessarily. Right. Um, there's a question. I, I will delve into this more deeply when we have more time. But um, I put it out there the other day because it, it really, it's been weighing on my mind a lot of late, which is, Look, let's say you're a millennial, right? You're you're starting your family, you've got a young family, and you want to buy a house, and you're looking at uh, the price of housing right now, which is the most unaffordable it's ever been for new home buyers, right? You've got high prices and high mortgage rates right now. And let's say you were willing to say, all right, but you know what? I'm going to live in this house for decades. I want my family to have a nice place. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to do everything I can to get in this house. But if you're looking ahead and you're thinking, okay, look, uh, in 10 years time, just like 10,000 baby boomers are hitting retirement age every day still, in 10 years time, that number is going to be 10,000 baby boomers are either being forced to downsize by you know moving into a nursing home or just having to get a smaller home or dying, right? And that is going to be lasting for decades, right? And that's going to be happening in the, in the not too distant future. If I've got a 30-year mortgage, if that's my, my, my timeline on my house, why would I pay top dollar today for a 30-year mortgage if I know there's going to be this big selling wave starting halfway through that 30-year period, right? I, I don't know a good answer to that question. I, I, don't know, I don't know the compelling answer that says, oh, well, here's why you should do it, right? So, but no, I think that's going to be the very interesting thing about this is that, you know, we held interest rates at zero for so long. And it made mortgages so cheap and housing prices so expensive because, again, you know, when we buy houses, we should buy something we can afford, right? But we, we were able to buy much bigger houses and more expensive houses because rates are so cheap. We shouldn't have done it financially, but it was because it was available. And, and real estate agents are great about, you know, you know I'd say my budget is 250 Yeah, but you can buy a $1,000 house because rates are so cheap. Yep. But, you know, we've created all this distortion because of all this liquidity, because of zero interest rates for so very long that, you know, the, the future out. And that's what I'm saying. Look, I'm totally speculating on what could happen when rates get cut back to zero. Maybe the market just takes off running again like, a, a you know, it's called eight. But, you know, at some point there are a lot of baby boomers and, and Gen Xers that do want to downsize. Their kids are leaving. Their, my kids are leaving the house. You know, they're going to college. And my wife are in the process of downsizing now, but you know that's 
I think that's become more prevalent in the years to come. Especially well, well, sorry to interrupt, but there, there are folks that there. want to now. They're going to have to at some point in the exactly. not too distant future. Yeah, right. And that and that's what I was about to say. There's going to be the downsized part, and then there's going to be a part from downsized to hospice, which yeah. is all you know, all part of this this process that could provide a, a large supply of inventory in the market at a time that you don't want it. So we'll see. Yeah, I just don't. I, 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 I just if you're if you're doing the math as a younger person to buy the house, it it really doesn't work for you. If if you believe that that is indeed going to happen on that time frame. Um, all right, but we'll have to dig into that at a different uh, future one of these videos. So um, very quickly, what trades did you make this week, if any? None. Um, the reason we didn't make any this week is because it was end of the quarter rebalancing. We really didn't know what the market was going to do. There was potential for about 20 to $30 billion worth of selling this week. So, you know, we could have had a, this week could have been a three to 5% correction week, or it turned out to be just a, you know, kind of a consolidation week and a lot of volatility everywhere. So. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about sector rotation lately. We had been kind of banking up on some of those sector rotation trades, energy, et cetera. Those, that rotation occurred and we're seeing money flow into those areas. We saw some weak, weaker performance out of technology. So again, that's all kind of playing out the game plan. Now, next week, once we get past the 4th of July, uh, there's a couple of positions. We'll, we'll probably have some trades next week because there's some positions that we want to add to, to our portfolio. Okay. And should Michael know what those are when I have him on next Friday? Yeah, of course, because by the time you have him on, we'll have done the trades. Okay, okay, great. All right, well, look, um, have a great time off next week, Lance. Um, just in yeah. wrapping up here, I want to remind everybody all the reasons that Lance and I talked about what could, should, might, maybe not, won't, potentially could happen going no forward idea. from here. <laughs> um, it is a very tricky time for the individual investor to try to navigate all this while they're also just trying to deal with all the demands of their own life, which is why we very frequently on this program, um, reiterate our, our uh, main bit of advice to folks, which is we highly recommend that you work with a, a, a good, experienced, professional financial advisor who can build a customized portfolio plan for you, uh, taking into account all of the macro issues that Lance and I talk about here. And you'll find if you talk to a number of financial advisors out there, especially your garden variety ones, most don't. Most don't take this stuff into to consideration, they're really pretty much just momentum chasers, or they're just guys that are out there to collect your your money, stick it somewhere, and then not look at it. Um, so, anyways, if you've got a good one who is doing the right things, there, great. You should stick with them. They are very rare. But if you don't have one, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even Lance and his team there at Real Investment Advice, uh, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just go fill out the short form at Wealthion. Dot com Only takes a couple of seconds. Then these consultations that you get coming out of that, they're totally free. Uh, they sit down, they ask you, you know, all about your particular situation. They tell you what they think you should do. There's no charge to it. There's no commitment to work with them. They just do it as a public service to try to help as many people as possible position prudently now for some of the, the things that Lance and I have, have said may be coming down the pike here. Um, and if you've enjoyed uh, today's discussion, if you really like these Weekly market recaps, if you're going to go into a week of mourning and wearing black because Lance isn't going to be here next week and we're going to have to make do with uh, Mike Leibowitz, who honestly, folks, is an upgrade, but I'm not going to tell Lance that. Uh, do us a favor, support these, this series by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, as usual, you get the parting word. Yeah, well, just because you don't ever invite me to speak at your conference. So people can go to our website as well. And ask questions. Always happy to help you out as well. So just go to realinvestmentadvice.com. Awesome. All right. Uh, Lance, buddy, thanks so much for another great week. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching and have a wonderful July 4th if you're one of the folks that lives in the U.S.